So he flies out there and makes a big circle around, throws a milk carton out of the window. So we go over there and we fetch it out of the water and there's a note inside of it that says, one of you guys has got to agree to go here because there's another boat that needs unloading. When we pulled up there to get loaded, these guys were single file back to back, throwing on this boat, throwing on that boat. And it just, here it come, here it come. He calls himself the saltwater cowboy. So tell us a few stories about, you know, the earlier days um, in Colombia and stuff like that elsewhere, and then kind of lead that up to some sketchy stories. Okay, sure. Yeah, I can. Uh, well, let me take you back to um, being in Colombia mm -hmm. and counting the bales and chesting them and checking them like that. See, my two partners in Miami and I had gone together and bought a, a, a late 70s model corporate Lear. And I could get to Columbia in between five or five and a half hours, depending on the, on the wind, you know? So I could leave early in the morning, go down and spend the day working and doing what I need to do and fly back and then drive back into Naples and be sitting across the bar from my girlfriend by, you know, nine, 10 o'clock that night until her never wow. knowing that I leave the country. But the first time that I was approached to say, you know, once I said, yeah, dude, you know, when, when um, George said, can you do this? I got with Carlito and Leo and they gave me, the first one was a bit of a test job. They said they wanted me to go to Columbia, take care of the whole thing myself, you know, and, you know, make sure that it goes off without a hitch, you know, so no problem. I get on the jet early in the morning and I'm flying, you know, I guess, like I said, about a five hour trip and we're flying out, we, you know, we, when we're, we're feet dry in Northern Columbia and you're flying and looking out the window and all you're seeing is a sea of green, you know, the jungle. And then all of a sudden, out of that sea of green, you see a little white spot off in the distance. That's where this fucking jet's going to land. <laughs> so they make their approach treetop level, and I can see the mansion on the side of the hill when we fly past it. And he lands on this very well-groomed, very well-taken-care-of jungle floor airstrip. Dirt. Clay is actually what it was. And, um, it, it, surprisingly enough, it could be done. It was done rather well. So we pull in there, me and my buddy Ruben, who I took down to translate for me, cause I don't know fucking Spanish, you know, or what the fuck. So we get there and we don't actually see him right away. The boss, you know, that's all you'll ever get out of me is the name is the boss. And they, um, put us in an apartment in the back of the house. Now this apartment is about four times as big as my house at home you know, and we showered and we, you know, got ready and we're getting ready for dinner. And they had a, you know, we did the traditional cliche. They, you know, we threw Scarface v VHS tape on and watching that. Cause they had like four bowls of Coke all the way around the apartment that we could do for whatever. Wow. And you know, like a dummy, I go start doing a, you know, some rails and now I'm not no appetite. You know, I'm doing this, you know, so dinner time, we walk through the middle of the house, which is a garden area, kind of a courtyard. And we walk into, um, this, what's like a ballroom living room. The boss is sitting here and, you know, I get a cocktail and I sit down, you know, and we're, and we're talking. And, um, this is after having coming back from, you know, weighing and, you know, or, or, you know, prior to that, you know, this is, you know, I'm kind of skipping around a little bit, but, you know, once we get there. Then we go through the way process and like that. We get back to the house and we shower and, you know, we get ready to have dinner. So we go into the ballroom area where everybody's sitting and there's, I mean, there's women all over the house, you know, beautiful women. Um, and, you know, a lot of the guys that I saw during the day while we we're doing the work and shit like that, you know, so we're having a cocktail and I'm talking to the guy and, you know, being translated with, you know, and this guy comes in, you know, out of, uh, into the room that I had not seen that day. And he walks up behind the boss and he does one of these into his ear and, the, and, and I'm looking right at him and his face just goes ashen like that. And he puts his cocktail down, he gets up and he starts to fast walk across the room. And he's walking, he's, gonna, he's headed toward the kitchen. So I put my cocktail down and I'm fast walk right behind his fucking ass, right? He goes through the kitchen, out the kitchen door and across the veranda 
down the stairways and into the backyard, which is lit because all the compound lights are facing toward the house. And he's run, now he's bolting, and I'm bolting right behind him. He runs about 20 feet into the jungle past these lights to where it's dark, and I ran probably 20 feet past him and then went like this, like a you know, swimmer off the starting blocks <laughs> and into the bushes, and I'm laying there and waiting for all hell to break loose because, I mean, this fucking guy just ran out of his house scared to death. And I'm sitting there, and it, it, it seemed like an hour, but I think only a few minutes went by, and I hear this voice out the back door in Spanish, like this. And I hear this guy, <laughs> you know, laughing. And I'm thinking, what in the holy fucking hell, you know? So I see his silhouette walking out up back toward the house, and I get out of there, and I'm picking the shit off of me. And by the time I get back into the room where everybody was partying and hanging out, he's already in his chair with a drink, sweating profusely like this. And I get in, and I sit back down, and his guy asks my guy to translate. He says, where in the fuck did you think you were going? He's asking me. And I said, well, you know, I'll be honest with you, when the big dog gets up and runs out of the fucking house, <laughs> my ass is running out with him. And he started laughing, right? <laughs> and um, everybody thought it was a big joke. And I was, you know, I was kind of pissed about it, you know. But what it had turned out was the reason why he laughed was because prior to us getting there, he had his wife and his children go stay with his in-laws while we were there and he was doing business. He never had the family around while there was somebody staying with them at the house. So somebody of his crew down the switchback to get from his house to the lowlands, somebody down there had told him that your wife's on her way up the mountain. And he went, fuck. And the last thing he wanted to be seen with is a bunch of guys in a house full of whores and coke everywhere. <laughs> you know? So he, he left and left his buddy Rico to take the blame for whatever the fuck was going on in the house, you know, because they they would all vouch for like him, he right? He wouldn't be there. He wasn't even here. Yeah. He doesn't know, you know, that kind of thing. Entertaining. Yeah. But as it turns out, he he goes back, he says, uh, it wasn't even his fucking wife coming home. <laughs> it was just somebody coming up the fucking mountain, man. He ran out and I'm thinking to myself, this guy's, you know, a billionaire. He's the head of his own little cartel here. And he turns into a big giant pussy when his fucking wife thinks she's going to come home. <laughs> Wild. Oh, uh, yeah. So that was my first trip out of there. The next morning, we got back on the jet and flew off home, another five hours home. And then I had set a boat back to, you know, to get what I had marked out that day, you know. So and then it turned back into, you know, like business as usual. But when I say as usual, there was a lot of times when, you know, things got a little bit sketchy, you know, to a point where we're like, you know, it's dangerous, kind of scary, sketchy. And I didn't get that way ever, but maybe once or twice. And this was one of them. And what had wound up happening was we were expecting a load on this freighter to be 60,000 pounds. So we dedicated three boats, our boat and two other boats to go out wait around like we typically do to go through that scenario I imparted to you and get loaded from this boat. Well, that afternoon we're sitting out there offshore and everybody's fucking around. They got the boats tied together. We're swimming and diving and fucking getting stoned. And, and um, out of nowhere comes this single engine Cessna airplane flying about, he must have been only 20 feet off the water coming from our stern. And you can't hear an airplane. Flying that close to the water. It's fucking Barry Seal flying in there. Didn't hear the fucking, don't check this out. We didn't even hear the fucking thing until he pulled it up and just missed our low rand antenna. That's how close he got to us. He was fucking with us. And it turned out to be Daryl Daniels. Guy I was telling you about the, you know, one of the brothers. This wow. was his job. And he has this airplane because part of their seizures, I told you, was airplanes, cars, boats, truck. Well, he had this Cessna and this airplane and could fly it, but didn't have a license to do so. He only had the money to pay a guy to show him how to fly the fucking thing, right? So he's got this airplane. So he flies out there and makes a big circle around, throws a milk carton out of the window. So we go over there and we fetch it out of the water and there's a note inside of it that says, one of you guys has got to agree to go here because there's another boat that needs unloading. So we need to get you, you know, I think you other two can handle that, you know. So they flipped the coin, the other two, because we were going originally with, you know, where we needed to go. So one boat takes off. So that night progresses. We get the call sign, Felipe, 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 Zorro. He says it twice. 
And the guy comes back, Felipe, 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 Zorro, come on. So we go up there and we get, you know, up to this boat. And this fucking thing was like, Jesus, it was a freighter. I mean, it was fucking huge. And we couldn't even throw lines up on it. That's how high up it was. So Captain Billy, who generally might be on the deck kind of helping out a little bit and shit like that, had to stay at the wheel. And so did the other captain to keep our boat up against theirs. Because we didn't have to this time get up to help the crew. There had to been, I don't know, 60 dudes on this boat. I mean, it was a, I mean, this thing was a freighter. It was huge. So what it was taking place was when we pulled up there to get loaded, there was a hatch on the deck on one side of the, of the back of the giant wheelhouse and another hatch on the other side. These guys were single file back to back down through one door, coming out the other door with a bale on their shoulder back to back, throwing on this boat, throwing on that boat. And it just, here it come, here it come. And then by this time, these things are, these are packed and they're coming from 16 feet up is, is how high the weather deck is from our deck bang crack and we're starting to hear after a while we're starting to hear the fiberglass like this but us trying to stay out of the way and not get creamed by one of these fucking things and the 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 inability to move them as fast as these fuckers were throwing them they started stacking up which bouncing off of one another saved the deck and the boat from getting cracked all the fuck so we managed to get it under control and we're loading this fucking thing and we got to figure that you know we're getting it about 450 pieces is about what we should have on our boat they should have about the same on the other boat and we should have the load so we're you know billy's doing kind of a rough count while he's kind of you know keeping the boat there and um we get to about what we think we should have and we yell up i yelled up to this captain on the deck and i said how many more and in his fucked up english because we're getting captains from all over the fucking place and he yells down 50 more and I'm thinking, we're thinking, okay, 50 more. So we're counting, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 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 uh, you know, 80, 70, 90. And we're like, fuck. And we all yell up in unison on our boat, how many more? And the guy looks over and he goes, 50 more. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking by this time, this is the only number this fucking guy knows, I think, you know, because this is fucking stupid. So, you know, on a boat, particularly on a, a fishing boat or a crab boat or vessel of that type, you know, they have what's called scuppers. Are you familiar with what scuppers are? Scuppers are designed for when water comes on the deck. It can flow to the stern and go out those holes and back into the water. So when you're pulling traps and you're getting the boat, the deck wet, all that shit's going out those scupper holes. Well, they were loaded us to the point where the scuppers were starting to go underwater. If the scuppers start to go underwater, the boat's going to take on water. It's going to get into the bilge and into the hold and the boat's going to fucking sink. So right away, we jump in and start, you know, run up to the wheelhouse and grab a life jacket, cut it the fuck open and pull all the wadding out of it that we can out of two life jackets and stuff those fucking scuppers as tight as we can to get them watertight because these fuckers were going to sink us. And they kept throwing this shit. And the only way that we could get away from them throwing it on us was just to start the boat and pull away. Because <laughs> it just kept coming, man. I mean, it was fucking ridiculous. And so we pull away and they're still throwing like there was a boat there, like there was two boats there. And I'm watching, we're watching these fucking guys all the way off, like the, onto the horizon. And they were still throwing that shit off the boat. And that type of scenario is very far and few between, but it does happen. Guys will load a boat and expect you to take whatever's on there. Well, the goddamn boat only holds so fucking much. And even if we had the third boat, they would have probably sunk him too, because there was, you know, if there was 60,000 pounds, there was a hundred thousand pounds on that boat. If there was 60, because they were throwing them motherfuckers for a good 40 minutes till they went out of sight. Cause we're not moving very fast. We're chugging along. So now we've got this giant ass fucking load on our boat and we're about, an, you know, an hour and a half into getting into shore. And there's the chase boat right next to us. The guy he's following us, you know, and we're, you know, and it was always our job to, you know, to test the shit, to, to, you know, to check it out, to make sure when we got on the hill, like, yeah, dude, you guys, you got to get some of this shit, you know, um, cause we're the first ones to get our hands on it. So here's this boat chugging along through the water, you know, 
and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and, and the boat starts rattling like a motherfucker, like it's coming apart. What had happened was that it was pushing such a load that one of the flutes on the prop on the boat broke off. Now there's only two instead of three. And that prop is, you know, six, 800 pounds. So it's a big old hunk of brass underneath there. So we weren't going anywhere. We could just barely move. So quick into action, up comes the other loaded boat in front of us. And we made a makeshift line for him to tow us. And it started towing us in. So we're sitting there, you know, everything's cool. We're back on track. You know, everything's good. We're going to make it in. You know, we got some work to do on the boat, but we've got a ways there that we can pull it up on. So I'm sitting up there and I'm thinking, oh, good. let's, you know, let's try the shit while we're at it. Well, come to find out, you know, nobody has a lighter. Nobody has papers. Nobody has a pipe. Nobody has any way to smoke any fucking weed whatsoever. And who, what pot holler doesn't have any fucking way to smoke weed, right? So... You know, ingenuity kicks in once again, and you use whatever resources you got. So we got this mountain of shit right in the back, you know, and it's it's up underneath the shade that we work on, you know, on the back of the boat, you know, and it's stacked up in there. So we wound up kind of pulling some apart and restacking and making a hole down to one of the deck hatches that was, you know, we had aluminum deck hatches. This one was a hatch that allowed a visual on the mechanism for the uh, for the rudder and the steering, like that. So all we did was clear everything off of that fucker. And we took one of the fish boxes that we use, you know, to put our stone crabs in and pulled that little wire off from around it. Well, Billy had a 12 volt battery up in the wheelhouse. And uh, so we grabbed the 12 volt battery, that piece of wire and a five gallon bucket. We go to that little spot on the back on that aluminum hatch. And we put about two big handfuls of weed on that aluminum hatch, put both ends of that wire on that 12 volt battery in it made a little red spot and we put it down there like that. And there's my buddy Mark down there, like a boy scout <laughs> getting that fucking shit going. And it starts smoking. And we put the five gallon bucket over it like this, fill it up with smoke and took turns, putting it on each other's head <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of bringing in a load in the middle of fucking yeah. hauling pot, you know, boat broke down and all this kind of shit. Wow. You know, what else you got to do? You got four fucking hours or so mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to fucking kill, but <laughs> You know, that was, yeah, that was a, that was a rough one there, man. That was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, and then from there, it starts to get, uh, obviously it starts to close out the life of, uh, you know, the life of a smuggler seems to always, it, it sucks to say, but it, there's always the tough part then that comes about. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I don't give a fuck who you are. It's inevitable, you know? If, you know, you play the game long enough, you know, eventually you're, you know, the uh, um, laws of averages catch up with you, I guess. There's no better way to explain it than that, you know, and when they did, unfortunately, that was, you know, like I said earlier, when the laws had changed and things, you know, of that nature. But, um, you know, everything that came, you know, that, that came of that and the reason why I'm able to still sit here and talk with you today was, you know, a bit of stroke of luck, if you will, because like I said earlier, that very particular sequence of events that I'm part of had to take place in order for me to be standing here talking to you right now. So when I got put, you know, um, and questioned about, you know, cooperation with regards to how are you, you know, those two treasury agents that I talked about earlier, they wanted to know cooperation wasn't going to happen. I said, you just kill me kill my family, kill the, kill the dog and the cat and everything. Because this, although all these years of doing this didn't involve a gun ever once and never did it involve any kind of a violence whatsoever, you throw one of these fucking guys under the bus and they're going to do exactly what they do very well. And that is come after your family and everybody and everything that matters to you because they're going to shut your ass the fuck up. So I'm not talking about Carlito and Leo because even I didn't know, like I said at that time, they were two soldiers of that Griselda Blanco that's how I got fucking involved with Noriega, you know, so there's no goddamn way in hell. But that's when they said, we would like to know rather than that, what we'd like to know is how you were able to do this for all this time and this many years and we couldn't catch you. And that's when I said, oh, fuck, I'll tell you that, you know, game's over. I can tell you how fucking stupid you are, <laughs> you know, and then we're back to the scenario about, you know, and I asking them how many ways in and out of there are there, man, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't take that shit over there on the backs of porpoises and pelicans, man. It went right down that one goddamn road, 
you know, quite literally. And here's the thing about this is I'm telling these people and they wind up taking me out of my um, federal holding cell in Fort Myers for, you know, I was held there for, for about eight months. Um, and they would take me out of there about twice a week or so like that and take me around the corner to the federal building and into a room and question me, you know, about shit and, you know, about how it works, you know, and this and that. And I said, I can tell you the shit that I've been up to, but I won't name any names. And if you can glean from what I tell you anything from that, then, you know, that's up to you, but you're not going to get it straight out of my mouth. So I start telling them about the sheer volume of shit. You know, when you, I told them the front page of the Naples Daily News of that day, I was arrested for uh, over 150 tons, nearly 400,000 pounds. What they didn't realize until about two to three weeks after they started affecting these arrests that that only um, amounted to about a week's work. <laughs> wow. And that's when they, they knew, you know, what the fuck, you know, like mm -hmm. this. And they started because of that, those ridiculous numbers and amounts that I'm describing and the money, you know, that was involved. Yeah. When you're talking about the paydays, like it's nothing <laughs> light and you're talking oh, weekly. No. Daily, even daily, you and know, sometimes two and three jobs at a time you're getting paid for. You fucking know? insane. And then you were also talking about how most of yours it was sun up to sundown, but how sometimes people didn't give a fuck, and it was so many that you just ran all day and all night. Well, all day during the day is when you had to ship it to Miami. That's yeah. that's the best way to do it. Hide it yeah. in plain sight. I mean, yeah. who the fuck is going to expect you're moving forty tons down the street? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> You know, and that's just as simple as it was, you know, as ridiculous as that sounds. I mean, that's just how it's done. Yeah. You know, and that's why I would be very interested in hearing how, you know, Mr. Lanier, you know, pulled off his offloads because, you know, that amount takes a considerable amount of number of people and vehicles, unless you're using tractor trailers, you know, and that kind of shit. But then you start doing that, you start drawing attention to stupid shit like that, you know? So, um, there is a, there is quite a contrast between the way people do things, you know, the way pot haulers who are, you know, who have, uh, um, quasi fame for that sort of thing, like Randy Lanier and, um, uh, Brian O'Day and, um, Robert Flatchhorn with the big, you know, the tuna gang and, you know, people like that, you know, um, um, everything is relative. You know, we were all had one goal in mind and, you know, and like I'm fond of saying that, you know, obviously we weren't the only pot haulers that ever bought pot into this country. We were the, we were able to, and what I tell about the story was in, in, um, integrated into a way of life that spanned over 40 years and three generations and, um, running these Southern waters and the, you know, the keys in the Caribbean with, with literally impunity. And a lot of times when I, in retrospect, when I look back on that kind of shit, you know, I, my ass goes, you could cut a cigar end off with my ass, you know, and I think about some of the shit I got myself into, but, um, I was, um, you know, once they come into my house and, you know, and took me away, you know, what was that night? Like, um, two in the morning, I think somewhere like that. I had a buddy of mine staying over. So it's a normal night leading into normal it. night, not just, you know, yeah you know, one of those. And I had a buddy staying at the house with me because the house he was renting now was being sold. So I said, ah, come on, it's, you know, hang out one of my rooms. I can give a fuck. So it's two 30 in the morning, thereabouts one morning. And I get, there's a knock on my front door and I'm like, what the fuck? So I walk out there in my underwear and scratching my nuts. And I look through the blinds like this. And I see this one sheriff's officer standing on the front porch. This is the one you yelled a minute ago. <laughs> and, uh, I see him out there. I tell my buddy Donald is staying there with me. I said, hey, tell that fucker I'm not home. You know, and I said, I thought that maybe that's the neighbors called because my dogs were barking, you know? And, uh, as soon as Donald opened that door, that fucking cop grabbed him and like this and threw his ass out into the front yard. And he said, there was like 20 guys out there dressed like ninjas. And before he knew it, he had, he probably had 10 gun barrels against his fucking head and face. And the guys are screaming. And he says, and I can hear this shit going on. I'm only down the hall back in my bedroom. And I hear this guy yelling, is Tim McBride in there? And I can hear Donald going, oh, yeah, he's in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, fuck, thanks, Donald, yeah, you yeah. fucker. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, and they come, you know, and there's lights. I see the lights in the hallway out the bedroom door, and they're all kind of doing like this. And I put my head around the corner, and he got me blinded like this. And I said, get that fucking light out of my eye. And all I can hear was, 
get on the ground, get on your knees, put your hands behind your head. And I went down and like this. Next thing you know, I got like five guys tackling my ass. I'm in my fucking underwear. You know, who the fuck do they think I am? Pablo Escobar or some shit, you know, and I could feel the guns against me like this. And then they cuffed me and they brought me out into the living room, set me on the couch and they cleared the house to make sure nobody was there because the warrant that they came with was for my arrest and not seizure or confiscation or anything else in the house. It was just for that. So they do their thing and I don't know, there's probably, I don't know how many fucking guys there are, man. I mean, it was like there was an army. I don't know who they were expecting. You know, it was how ridiculous this is, you know, from my point of view, you know, and once you understand the nonviolent, fucked up, fucked up, playful, you know, attempt that we made at all of this to be treated in that way, you know, I mean, I guess you have to expect that, right? So I'm sitting on the couch and they do their thing and they pick me up and pull me up and they're going to walk me out the fucking door. And I said, hey, I bought some fucking clothes. And I said, um, you know, take me back to where you tackled me. Let me get some fucking clothes. And the guy said, just sit the fuck down. I'll go get your clothes. Where are they? And I said, well, you know, that room, you know, that I came out of where you fucking tackled me. I said, there's a closet closest to the wall. I got, a, you know, shelves in there. Just grab some jeans and a shirt and, you know, and shit. And we're good. He wasn't back there five seconds. And I'm hearing, holy shit. Like this, and I yelled, wrong closet. <laughs> he had opened the first closet, and in that closet, I had six four by five deep vaulted safes stacked on top of one another. $6.7 million to get all together in these safes. And he said, threw my clothes at me like that, and he goes, well, you got no safes back there. And I said, would show me the piece of paper that says I've got to open them up and show you and I'll be happy to. Well, they didn't have that. I knew that, you know, or they would have, you know, done this thing a whole different way. All they had was a warrant for my arrest. So when they took me out of there, they put a seal on the front door and I took off and I was at the, I mean, they took me and paraded me around that morning. Like I was at the um, cust U.S. Customs field office that, you know, that they had in installed just for this operation. I went from there to the DEA's office. I went from there to the CIA. I went from there to the FBI. I went from there to the Secret Service. I went from there to ATF. Everybody who is anybody in law enforcement, I went to Sheriff's Trident Task Force out of, out of uh, Naples. JK might be familiar with them fucking guys. Um, they'll blow your front door off your fucking house, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, and here's, you know, they prayed me around because everybody wanted a fingerprint and a picture and then, you know, and shit like this. Well, when I get to the customs office, um, they put me in a room, lock me down to the bench like this. And then they bring in one of my Cuban partners that I'd worked with for years, Carlos, that lived in Golden Gate, the city right near me, and chained him to the bench right next to me. And the room wasn't as, was as big as a closet and they shut the door. And I know exactly what they, their intention was for us to, you know, start talking to one another like this. So we just sat there like we didn't know one another because I, I know they wanted us to start talking. So from there, I wound up, you know, they're taking me up to the, uh, the federal building up in Fort Myers where I was to be arraigned, all of us, you know, 38 of us that day to be arraigned in front of a federal magistrate, you know, for, you know, whether or not we, you know, we can get a bond or, you know, get out or something. But there were so many of us. It didn't matter, you know, the, your culpability in the crime, you know, I was considered managerial. A lot of the other guys were just considered helpers, you know, things like that, of that nature. But they, they bonded us all the same. I was, I didn't pay cash for any bond. I was given a, a surety bond because there was just too many of us and too much paperwork. They didn't want to fuck with it. And I, I didn't get out of there till 1130 at night when that guy, Jerry, over there came and picked me up. He was the only one that was willing to come to Fort Myers and bring my ass home that night, you know, and that's how far we go back, you know, but, um, it was, you know, it was a comedy of errors, you know, along the whole fucking way, you know, in a, in, like I said, a very particular sequence of events taking place. And what had happened was when I finally got sentenced and the judge Kavakovich, I'll never forget this fucking woman at the, um, at our arraignment in the very beginning. She's reading off our, you know, what we're being arrested for and what we're being indicted for. And she started telling me, you know, all these years and all this money and all this shit, you know, and, and the guy standing next to me, Teddy, there was six of us standing there and my crew guys and me all being arraigned at the same time. And Teddy goes, well, why don't you make it 30 million? 
<laughs> you know, just like that. And I start, I'm like, oh. I start laughing out the side of my face like this. And she pulled her fucking glasses off and she looked straight at me and she said, Mr. McBride, she says, sir, you are in serious trouble. She says, the men and women of this country didn't fight World War I, World War II, v- Korea and Vietnam for you to mess it up with drugs. And right then and there, I knew, oh, fuck, here it comes. She wound up ultimately saying that I have a mission beyond my job to see this through. And if you didn't play ball with this bitch, dude, you were gone, you know, for, for fucking sure. And she was serious. So after I'd done and told them about how stupid they were and how we were doing all of this kind of shit, you know, and, you know, and for all these years, this was the um, information that she at that time considered invaluable information because they had no clue. Um, after imparting to them the sophistication of what it was that they were up against. They had, they, they had no clue. We're just a bunch of dumbass backwoods fucking Everglades fucking ragnats, you know? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, some of us are capable of a little bit more than that. So rather than, you know, and at this time, my, my attorney, my million dollar attorney had negotiated for a cap on my sentencing you know, with regards to giving them that information. And they didn't consider it substantial enough cooperation to put me below the mandatory 10. Excuse me. They got away from the other three counts. They left me with one count. They agreed to that. So at that same time, they also agreed that they wouldn't give me less than 10, but they wouldn't also give me more than 20. So I was hovering within that teen range and expecting it. So when I'm standing there in front of her, you know, she's telling me about, you know, how she felt about everything and, and actually thanked me for the information, the the invaluable insight into my, you know, way of life. And she said, what I'm going to do, Mr. McBride, is I'm going to sentence you to Federal Correctional Institute in Tallahassee, FCI in Tallahassee, which in, within the Federal Bureau of Prisons is where they would send you if you wanted an education of any kind, whether it be college or, you know, you could be anything you wanted to be. They would, they had um, um, civilian professors and teachers that would come into the, what was in the, called the educational uh, compound in, in the prison. So, she said, and, and why I'm sending you there is because what I'd like you to do is take advantage of the, um, you know, what's offered to you there. So you can um, come out with the ability to make the kind of money that you're accustomed to. And I could, all I could do, keep from fucking laughing at her because <laughs> I'm thinking, where in the fuck are you going to teach me to make a couple of million bucks a night? you know, on any random fucking night, you know, but I did not, you know, that was my inner monologue, man. I was yeah. about to let that one go. Yeah. So, um, I wound up in, uh, ultimately wound up in Tallahassee, man. And, uh, and, uh, what she wound up doing was after, you know, you know, the insight that I gave her, she wound up giving me the mandatory, the 10, because she couldn't give me any, any more than that. So, um, going through this, you know, now I'm, uh, awaiting transportation to the prison you know, where I'm designated to in Tallahassee. So uh, about a week goes by and they gather me up and a couple of other guys into a bus and take us over to Miami to Miami Correctional um, um, MCC, which is next to the Metro Zoo. And um, whenever you're put into an institution and you're fresh into an institution, they put you in segregation until they have a chance to review your case to see what it is you're you know, you're adjudicated for. If it's a sex crime or a child crime or some shit like that, they're not putting you in general population because somebody will find the fuck out, you know, and kill your ass or whatever, because that shit just doesn't play. So you spend a couple of days in the hole before they put you to general populations. Well, I'm in the hole. I meet this guy, Jimmy Papadopoulos, this Greek who's in there for 2,700 pounds of cocaine. He's being sent, he's been sentenced 20 years for, and we get into the hole and it's, you know, and they keep those fucking things like a meat locker and they do that to torture your fucking ass. It's cold in, the, in a jail cell. But Jimmy had figured out that the louvers that the air comes out of were doubled. Backside was turned this way. Front side was turned the opposite. And there was a space in between where you could fold a newspaper just right and slide it in there and you could regulate the temperature of the room like this, right? And I'm thinking, that's pretty fucking cool, man. Because you learn a lot of jailhouse shit. You know, you learn how to make coffee. You learn how to make all kinds of shit. How not to freeze your ass off. Yeah. 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 So um, 
Jimmy gets out because he was there before me. So he gets out. He's in his own uh, GP. So my turn comes. I get out. I put into GP and they sign my bunk right next to the TV on the lower floor. And that fucking TV's on all day and, you know, until about 11 o'clock at night. So I'm, I go up to the dorm hack that has the bed book with your picture in it and your bed assignment. And I said, man, if you know, I said, if you don't mind, I said, I don't, can't be next to the television, dude. I said, is there any way possible I can get? And he said, go look around, find a spot, come out, let me know what it is. I'll change your bed book because I got your picture and your shit and they'll put you where you need to be. So when the count comes and they have to, if the count doesn't come out right the first time, they do what's called a bed book count. They'll come back with the book and they'll actually look at this bunk space and see the picture. Yeah, okay. Okay. He's here. You know, I'm like that. So I'm looking around and in the glass house, they call it in Miami Correctional MCC. Um, it's a admissions and orientations is for new people coming into the prison if, or it's for hold for trans over for, you know, going to other places. Um, so uh, ultimately I'm there for, for, you know, five weeks, but it, at that time I'm looking for the new bunk and I go up the stairs because along, along the upper balcony, there's an upper balcony that goes around the room and there's the glass walls and partitions on the, for the outside that go all the way from the floor to the ceiling is why they called it the glass house. But the balcony up above has two bunks, two bunks, two bunks, and like cubicles like this. So I'm going to go look upstairs. So I go to the cop stairs and I walk past the bathrooms and, and then the wall cuts in like this. And there's the first bunk and then the next bunk in the cubicle wall because there are four bunks in a cubicle. And there's Jimmy in the first fucking space on the bottom bunk sitting with some other guy and an old man across sitting on the other bunk all wrapped in a blanket like this. And he looks like he's about 80 years old or some shit. And, and Jimmy goes, hey, Timmy, Timmy, hey, what are you doing, man? I said, dude, I'm looking for a place to stay. He goes, and he points to the bunk above this old dude. There's your bunk right there. So I go down and tell the hack. He changed my shit. I bring my shit up. So I'm sitting, I'm talking. I'm sitting next down to the, to the old man. He's under this big ass, but he's in his blanket. And he's, you know, when we're talking, he goes, he goes, you know what? It's a motherfucking cold in here. He says, don't you think it's, he's got an Italian accent. Mm. Don't you think it's a motherfucking cold in here? And I said, I gotcha. So I went up <laughs> on the top bunk and I did the Jimmy trick. And I cut that fucking air off like that. Five minutes later, the old man takes off the blank and he looks over and goes, Timmy, he goes, you are a smarter guy. He says, I, I like you. <laughs> and he says, you know what? Tomorrow morning, he says, and it's Sunday morning. He says, tomorrow morning, he says, we'll go into the, to the, cap, to the mess hall, the chow hall. He says, we'll have a, we'll get a little donuts, a little coffee. He says, and we'll maybe take a walk around the lake and we'll talk. Well, inside that MCC compound, they had a little pond in there <laughs> and they had a, a, a walking track or a jogging track around it you know, on the, in the inner compound. So, and on Sundays, the uh, inmates, of course, make the food and the guys are learning to be bakers and bakers. They make some awesome, I mean, you get fed good in the federal system. If, if nothing else, you're fed good. So I said, okay, you know, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, so, you know, a couple minutes later, this guy, old man gets up and he goes to take a piss. And I look over at Jimmy and go, who the, Jimmy, who the fuck is this guy? Because there's people, there's guys walking past paying respects to the old man. Hey, Papa, how you doing, Papa? You know, like this. And I go, who in the fuck is Papa? He goes, dude, that's Papa Gambino. Salvadori Gambino. I'm like, no fucking shit. <laughs> I just wow. made friends with this fucking guy. He was in there on the same charge as Jimmy. He was part of the 2,700 pound cocaine deal. And his nephew. It was, yeah. Damn. So uh, what he asked me when we were walking, you know, doing our thing that next morning, he says, um, they knew what kind of time I had and I was looking at, you know, I was just taking it in, in stride. And he says, you know what? He says, Timmy, he says, you seem to be doing your time pretty, pretty okay. He says, now my nephew's having a really bad time. He says, I think maybe you can talk to him. And I said, Sal, Papa Sal, I said, I'd be happy to do that. But, you know, I mean, when it comes down to it, that guy's got to do his own time, man. I can't tell him how to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's in here, you know? And I said, but I wound up talking to the kid, you know, and I said, I couldn't give him any information. This is the first, never been arrested in my fucking life. And I get, you know, 16 life sentences <laughs> to start off with, you know I mean? Like what the fuck? And I'm going to give this guy some advice, you know? No, it's not going to happen. That's basically what I told him was, you know, time is yours, man. It's, it's yours to do. You know, and I wound up, um, you know, from there, I wound up getting on Con Air at uh, Homestead Air Force Base. What was that like? Uh, it's a trip, man. 
you know, they, um, no windows. They throw you up in there in a, in a plastic chair. And of course you're chained, your belly chained, you're shackled on your feet. An interesting um, bit of trivia is the federal marshals that transport inmates from wherever to wherever, that's their job. The distance between your right leg and left leg is, as the shackle is the same distance you need to step on that first step to get on Con Air. <laughs> that's an interesting little bit of trivia. That's how they judge the distance because if it were any shorter, you couldn't get on that jet. You couldn't step on it. So they had to make it big enough for them to do that because that's what they have to do, transport. And they're handing different, you know, they're trading off, you know, their, their handcuffs and shit. So they're all using uh, different ones. So they all have to be the same. But when they put me on this fucking thing, I was given what's called a black box. When they handcuff you like this, the black box goes around the mechanism in the chain in the in the front. So there's no way I can get to the fucking handcuffs at all. I was considered an escape risk. And one other guy that was there to try to break another guy out in a failed uh, escape attempt had a black box too. (laughs) (laughs) We were the only two on the plane. And it, you know, it's always been a myth about them chaining you to the floor. You know, they don't chain you to the floor. I mean, what happens if it goes down? Well, dude, you're chained to the fucking floor. Your shackles have a, you know, you, you put your shackle in and then they push a button and it goes. <laughs> if that plane goes down, your ass is going with it. Because but, but at that time, you are, you're nothing but a number. 0949818. That's me. <laughs> I'll remember that till the day I die. You know, but um, I went from there and, um, you know, wound up in Tallahassee where, you know, the first job they gave me, you know, of course, when you go to prison, you know, everybody works. You have to have some kind of a fucking job. And for three cents a fucking hour, my first job was construction, you know, fixing and building and this kind of shit. Well, I don't want to do this. Fu- I don't want to build this fucking place. So I meet a guy, I get a buddy in out in the weight yard, in the rec yard, and, you know, we become friends and, you know, I tell him like, you know, where I'm doing and what I'm at and shit like that. And he just happens to be one of the clerks down in the education building in the law library. Now, every federal prison and every state institution by law has to give inmates the availability to and access to legal material. Well, they have clerks that learn how to help you guide your way and help you with your sentence and, you know, how to figure out, you know, whatever, you know, please or um, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and um, he said, let me take you down and introduce you to uh, Dennis. Dennis Lehman was his name. Now, Dennis, when he met me, immediately called me Timmy, which is, kind of, which is cool. I mean, everybody calls me Timmy. I, was, I, I, kind, of, I kind of dig that. But you know, that's, a, that's an immediate show of their you know, liking of me, if you will, or, or, or you know, their particular type of affection, you know, what kind of person they are. They, they tip their hand when they do that. And I wound up, you know, talking to him for a few minutes and he talked to the head woman in the library, the regular library, and they wound up making the change and swapping me and I became a clerk in in the law library. Now, um, Dennis, when I first met him as a bank robber, he had been in for 32 years already when I met him that day. And he was listed or may still be is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records for having been given the most amount of time for that particular crime, which was bank robbery. And the fucking guy didn't even rob the bank. He flew the airplane for the two guys that actually robbed the fucking thing. But what was taking place was the two robbers, one got six years, one got 12 because of their culpability and their actions during the, during the course of the, um, the, the crime. They gave Dennis 52 fucking years because for, for years prior to that, he was flying cocaine from Mexico to Nevada and they couldn't catch his ass. <laughs> so when they finally had something to, to, to catch him on, they screwed his fucking ass to the wall. And God's in the hand of God, 52 fucking years, this guy, man, and uh, was passed up on parole for, 20, for 32 of those. You know, but um, he's the one, I mean, he was really a, you know, a clever guy, really very smart guy. Um, Another bank robber is um, a very intricate part of the story, George, and um, who I had, uh, uh, was in the same unit with. And every night, to give you a little, you know, premise of the book, every night, um, besides the four o'clock count in the afternoon, there's a count at 10 o'clock at night. So everybody has to stand up and stand by their bond. Can you get counted? You know, and once the count, one officer will go around and count. 
Then another officer will go around and count, and if they're both their counts match up, then they shut the door and walk out, and everything's cool. Well, between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, lights out at 11. So we've got an hour between 10 and 11, and that's when George and I played rummy, gin rummy, you know, together. And it just so happened that, you know, after a little bit of, you know, we were, you know, started that routine, he finally asked me, he said, Timmy, how the fuck did you wind up here? You know, and I knew he was a bank robber. He knew I was a smuggler, but we didn't know the, any of the details. <clears throat> so I said, you know, George, if you're finally going to ask me that question, I said, let me go back to the beginning and, you know, and here we go. So the story is told woven between games of gin rummy and my telling this story, you know, which I think you may have picked up on by now. And um, it also goes on to tell how George wound up being 28 years so far for bank robbery when I met him and how his bank robbery took place and how he got caught. That's in there too as well, because I felt it was important to tell his story because the people that I spent those years locked up in and, and the bonds that you forge in an environment like that cannot be forged anywhere else in the world. It's very special. So I knew that the story other than talking about all the fucking craziness that is involved in smuggling and growing up in that industry, you know, and seeing the evolution of it up through even, you know, taking us out of the picture and ending Caribbean marijuana literally from coming into this country in 1989. That's when it stopped. When they took my crew and all the other five crews I was running out of the picture, it quit. That's when the mids, Mexican mids started showing up, you know, but, um, you know, I had, um, you know, I had started, you know, I told that, tell him that story. And then, you know, uh, I would tell a little bit about my upbringing and, you know, it was a normal up, average upbringing, nothing, you know, um, dysfunctional in my family that caused me to become an outlaw in any way. It just fucking happened. And I just, it just happens to be, you know, I'm fond of saying, don't call me a criminal. I'm an outlaw because criminals are, have everything associated them with, including violence. You know, and all that goes along with that. I'm an outlaw. I'm not a violent person. I'm just working outside your law that I don't happen to fucking agree with, you know, that sort of thing. So telling that story and, you know, in that way and weaving it through what's taking place in prison and my life in there, because it was part of what took place. And then, you know, I would be come to the end of a story and it would be lights out. Wake up the next morning and I talk about a little bit about prison and how it's going and he introduces you to some characters and what fucking takes place in there and some crazy shit goes on in there too as well. But the next night we begin another game of poker and George says, you know, tell me some more about that crazy fucking shit you do. And that's how it goes back and forth, back and forth like that. And um, I knew that when I wrote this, it was, um, it was mostly, well, primarily all about the pot smuggling and the craziness of that. But I also knew at that time that these people were so important to me and, and integral in that part of my life that I needed to somehow get them into the story. And I was trying very desperately to figure out how I was going to do that. And I just out of a clear blue sky one night, I woke up, it was dead in the middle of the night, and I knew exactly how to do that. And then that's what you read today. Yo, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here at Grow Generation, and guess what? Drip Hydro storming the market. All the best growers I know are switching to it. And guess what? There's a reason, because it's preserving terps. I keep hearing that, preserving terps. And that's why we're here with Sunshine, facility advisor, facility manager, overall the man with Drip Hydro. Listen to why it's different, man. What's going on, guys? Sunny here with Drip Hydro. Thing is, at the end of the day, we just wanted to make a simple, clean, cost-effective nutrient line that nobody has really seen on the market right now. Nobody uses really our chelation formulas. Uh, the micronutrients that we have pulled to make this line is really just what makes it overall bringing that consistency and quality back to what we want to see in growing herb again. And overall, at the end of the day, it's still really light on your wallet. It's a five part nutrient line. And again, if you're not staying sterile or you have a big facility and you don't want to run rock wool and you want to run a mix of cocoa with an enzyme or something, you don't even have to run flow with it. So at the end of the day, it's just saving you money on your wallet while bringing the consistency and the quality of terps back. We wanted to bring the terps back and bring the soul back to grow. Versatility, cost effective and quality. I mean, what else can you ask for? Drip Hydro, first smoke of the day, 
Friday. Blackleaf approved. Peace. So we got a special offer for you guys. Whether you go in person or you order online, any grow generation, over 60 nationwide retailers. The code is FIRSTSMOKE10 and you're gonna get 10% off, an additional 10% off your already discounted price. Use the code FIRSTSMOKE10. Tell them the First Smoke family sent you. They're gonna take care of you. Support the show, hop on the Patreon. We got new shows dropping, we got off the mic. We have so much stuff in store for you guys and stuff dropping every single week. Hop on the Patreon, first smoke of the day. New shows, checking in with Pat Gods and Blackleaf. We're doing a live each month and a lot of other shit. Off we the haven't mic. told you guys yet. Make sure you get on the Patreon. We'll see you guys soon, peace. I love it, man. I love it. <laughs> There's you know, more. You want well, more? I want to know what you're up to now. I, I mean, want to know what no, you're Well, before we skip ahead too, mm -hmm. like hearing you talk about prison, I feel like that was a big turning point for your life as it would be for anyone's life. Yeah. Um, after you get to Tallahassee and kind of get, you know, your first couple of years down, what's going on and like, what are the types of things that, you know, go down and just what what are some crazy stories right. that you know i know there's some definitely some shit you see prison in prison in those much different yeah much different prison in those days is much different than what's being depicted in prison today it wasn't racially it was to a degree racially segregated in that way but the gang influence didn't exist mm. it wasn't there and it just wasn't that that way even though i was in a, what they call a medium level security which is next to maximum security is the next level because I was considered an escape risk. Why I do you think that is? Just because you were like in and out of the country so I much? I was everywhere. I could go anywhere and, and they would, I mean, I, I could, they wouldn't have found me. <laughs> just put it that Columbia, way, man. Been on Yeah, because, okay, yeah, move. it makes sense. Yeah, Fire, yeah I get it. You know, so they I weren't willing it. to risk that, you know. Yeah. So the prison I was sent in, in Tallahassee was, like I said, was a level four or five. And that's, that's an interior fence with a snitch wire and razor wire that's about 10 feet tall. There's a killing field of about 15, 20 feet between that and another higher perimeter fence that also has razor wire, razor wire on top of it and a gun tower with two guards and two rifles in it every 50 yards completely around and two pickup trucks that circle that compound 24-7, 365 days a year. But I did, I was, I did while I was there, witness two escapes. <laughs> really? They actually happened. Yeah. Three, actually. Yeah. Because you wouldn't think anyone would try it. Yeah. Well, you know what? It was pretty. Yeah, I mean, these, you know, convicts can be very clever. I mm -hmm. mean, you got nothing to do but sit around and think about shit, you know. And when you hear that on television or during a movie or whatever, it's absolutely true. In one instance, you know, in particular, um, there was this uh, Colombian guy that was in there and he spoke very little, if any English whatsoever. And he was given, I think he was given 23 years. Well, he worked in a section of the prison called Unicor. What Unicor is, is they build the desks and the chairs and, the, and everything used in offices throughout the rural prisons. That's where they manufacture. And he worked in there because he had been there already for like six years. Well, he fashioned in himself a home, handmade pair of wire cutters. And managed to smuggle them out of Unicor. Well, what he wound up doing with them, and when I first got to the prison, they were building a new sally port. You know what a sally port is? A sally port is an entrance by which a busload of prisoners would pull in, the gate would shut behind them, gate in front of them would open, and the truck, the bus would go through. So there's never an open space between the inside and the outside of the prison. That's what a sally port is. Just as I was getting there, they were building the new Sally Port, the one that they had prior and was using prior, because this is an old prison. This, is, looks, this motherfucker looks like Shawshank. You know? There was no air conditioning, and this is Florida. I mean, it was fucked up. But what they had for Sally Port was only that 20-foot distance between the perimeter and the inner perimeter fence. They had gates on them, and there was no rolls of razor wire. They, they dismissed the killing field like that. So that was their entrance. So when they abandoned that and opened the new entrance in the back, they didn't put the razor wire in the killing field. So this fucking guy goes out early one morning, you know, you get let out for chow at like six in the morning, you know, and you can either eat chow or you can go to the rec yard, you know, on, on the weekends. It don't matter. 
Well, this fucking guy, he goes out there with his little schnippers and he winds up going down the hill to the next compound, to the, to the education building compound fence that doesn't have any kind of a, you know, warning signal to it, cuts through that and gets to the perimeter fence where there's no razor wire in the killing field. And, but there's a snitch wire. And what a snitch wire is, is a really thin piece of wire that runs the entire perimeter fence all the way around. And if somebody should happen to touch the fence at that particular point, a light would go off in the control room and tell them exactly where somebody touched the fence at. So he made these and fashioned these cutters in such a way where he could snip right through that fucking wire and not even budge it. So he wound up cutting through that, going through, cutting through the other thing and like that. But while he was <laughs> doing that, the upper compound is where the track is in the soccer field. And there are six handball courts that we also use for racquetball courts. Well, they're only 25 feet from the perimeter fence on that side. And all you have to do is, you know, take one of those balls and smack it against the fence and the cops will come running, you know? And um, that's what he asked him to do. He said, you know, at such and such a time, he said, you know, whack that fence a couple of times. That'll keep him over there. Mm -hmm. And he went right out that fucking thing, but they caught him a week later because Dude, he's from Colombia. He doesn't speak English and he didn't know where the fuck he was. He'd, you know, it's like, where are you going, man? You know? No they, way. Yeah, they fucking had you him. You got to go back to Colombia at that point. found yeah. him freezing oh, his ass man. off in somebody's back fucking yard. <laughs> yeah, you got to have money and resources to get anywhere yeah. once you're like out. Like my buddy, what, do you do, to, um, you know? what was his name? Wayne. Mm -hmm. I think he's in, in the book. Um, he was the warden's trustee. And he had gotten, I think, 17 years on a pot pot thing but there were special circumstances involved which got him that much time and it just as it happened he's from marathon in the keys and he was the one according to him he was telling us that he was the one that actually funded jimmy buffett's band to get started you know in the business he gave buffett the money to buy all the instruments and everything he needed and funded his first several gigs so he was telling the warden this and he's like you know my friends, Jimmy Buffett. And, you know, if you would agree, you know, he would be very much interested and would like to, if you would allow him to come to Tallahassee here and play for, the, you know, the guys. And for, you know, it took a little bit of doing, but he went, the uh, warden finally agreed. And Jimmy Buffett pulled in to the, up to the upper compound with a tractor trailer truck and a flatbed trailer and his band on the trailer and played for two hours to a literal captive audience. It was just the coolest thing. Man. Wow. Holy shit. Yeah. I've got pictures. Pot funded his, the, I think his career and he's now he's giving back. That's amazing. And he was, yeah. And it was one of the coolest fucking things, you know, I mean, for him to, to do something like that, but then it wasn't. I guess it was just before, I mean, that was like in October, -ish, whatever like that. We're coming into the holiday season and um, just before Christmas time, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, Wayne, the Jimmy's buddy and the warden's um, trustee, he's got run of the fucking front office. He goes out and has his lunch out front, you know, or he goes out there and smoke a cigarette under the tree or some shit. You know, he can come and go in and out that front door. Nobody pays attention. He's, he's what they call a one out, your custody level. You know, my custody level was four, so I wasn't going fucking nowhere. But the longer you stay in there and the more time that you do, you visit your team and your counselors and they reduce your custody level as you go along so you can eventually work your way out of the system. Well, he was at that time a one out, meaning he could go outside the fence, like the guys that go out and mow and take care of the, the shit. Well, one day just out of the blue, he calls a taxi from the phone on the warden's desk and the guy comes out front he jumps in it and drives off <laughs> <laughs> holy shit gone <laughs> did he did he get awesome. away or what yeah he's fucking gone man I'm like, well i got out but i don't know yeah. if you ever got him again you know because i was out before that but yeah he just walked out the front door got in a car and took off <laughs> you know? uh, like an uber to the uh, prison yeah <laughs> you know, and my shit. buddy oh that reminds me too dude, oh four escapes my buddy richie wow. this is a good one Richie was a kid that I met in Sarasota because I did a little time. They pushed me up to Sarasota uh, to the to the lockup up, up there in the county jail and then back down to Fort Myers because they were doing some work in the in the unit. And I met this guy um, um, in Tallahassee or in uh, you know in in um, Sarasota, and um, he had always told me he he had gotten nine years. He got caught with a sailboat with six hundred pounds of, of shit from Belize, you know. 
And he says, um, and we're talking one day just kind of casually. He says, you know, where the, you know, he said, you know, wherever they send me, he said, if they ever lower my custody to one out, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. gone, man. Mm -hmm. I'm going home. Fuck this shit. So, you know, time goes on. I go back to Fort Myers. We lose contact with one another. And lo and behold, I get to Tallahassee. And who's there? Richie. <laughs> he was designated the same fucking spot. So we're doing time together, you know, and in prison, you can buy, if you have enough money for commissary, you get an Iron Man watch, you know, you can buy sunglasses, you can buy sweatshirts and, you know, and tennis shoes and shit like that, you know, stuff that if your family gives you money because making three cents an hour, like I was, or six cents after I first year, you know, you, that goes into your commissary and that's all the money you got to buy with, you know, so people can put money in your account and shit like that. So he had a, you know, Iron Man watch, he had sunglasses and tennis shoes, all kind of shit. So about a year and a half, we're into this thing. And we're all out in the compound after dinner and it's getting dark. You know, we're all out in the outer compound just kicking around and bullshit and stuff like that. And I look over at Richie and he's giving away his watch and he's giving away his sunglasses and he hands a pair of shoes to this old man, you know, if you take, give him his tennis shoes. And I walk, I say, Richie, what in the fuck, man? And he says, dude, I just got designated one out. I go outside to mow the yard tomorrow. I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so he had already, you know, cause he knew mm -hmm. this custody level change was coming. He had already made an arrangement with his wife because from one side of the compound where the units are, if you look through the windows out the back, you can see through the woods that in the, in this, in the fall when there's no foliage, you can see cars down on a highway down there through the woods every now and then want to go by or this way or this way. So he knew there was a fucking road down there. So of that first day, they let him out to go mow the yard and they don't count. Those inmates are out there until you come back in at 3.30 for four o'clock count. So he had from seven o'clock in the morning till 3.30 to go. As soon as they let his ass out that back door, he went straight for the woods, down through the woods, got in his car with his wife and they drove all the way around through Texas and down through Mexico to Belize. And, and he was home free because there is no extradition treaty in the country of Belize. So he knew he had it made. Four months later, <laughs> I get a postcard with nothing written on it, but wish you were here wow. with a Belizean stamp on it. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, <laughs> My boy, Richie, man, that was cool. I mean, you can't make this, this, this shit up, you know? Yo, I mean? Shout out to Richie. I hope you see this, man. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That's though. crazy. I mean, you know, and the craziness goes, goes on from there, man, you know? Um, when I finally wound up doing my time, you know, I was, uh, working in the law library, like I was, I had an advantage of a, um, correspondence course that Rolando, my workout partner, the guy that got me the job. And I, we took a correspondence course to the university of Honolulu and got law degrees as paralegal. Cause if we're working in the, as a law clerk, we should understand this shit. We figured, so let's fucking dive in. Well, I got 10 fucking years, you know, what the fuck, why not? So Along with that, I got a degree in literary arts as well. And on top of that, Dennis Lehman, the bank robber that we worked with, was a very prolific and published author of a book called The Get Backs of Mother Superior. And it was just a, and it, and it, I think it was Doubleday that signed him on and took the book, but it was a really cool and awesomely hilarious book about when you go to prison, a lot of guys get nicknamed according to their crime. You know, it just inadvertently, it happens like that sometimes. Well, this guy in the book robs a bank dressed like a fucking nun. So when he gets caught and sent to prison, his nickname is Mother Superior. So the get back of Mother Superior was when they finally put him up in administration building up front and they, he got in front of a computer, he figured out how to open all the doors and all this shit. And he let the guy, let the, open the doors and let the prison open and let the prisoners out. <laughs> yeah, awesome. you know, but, yeah. you know, but besides that, he had taught a fictional writing class and I had just, you know, I was there all the time. So I took his fictional writing class and what I got from him that I didn't know that I would be, you know, leaning on later on in my life and, you know, had no intention whatsoever of ever writing a book, but it turns out that what I got from him was learning how to how to give you those olfactory and tactile sensations and the, you know, the, the, the feel of the sun in your face, you know, and all of that, 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 that fills in the void of, you know, that takes all the, you know, images of what you have pre-received in your mind and gives you the actual image. He taught me that. 
you know, plus my literary arts degree, can I kind of help me piece this thing together, you know, in that way. But, you know, it was a book that was written because, you know, I felt that it was important because first of all, I, I hear the story about uh, Brian O'Day and his um, 60,000, whatever pounds or whatever of Asian weed, uh, the Zion Coptics and their million pounds, which most of it we moved, um, the, um, uh, black tuna gang and their half a million pounds that they touted out of, you know, Miami, which flat had flat ass admitted that there were other guys out there moving. He moved a fraction of what other guys moved. He was looting to us and George Young and his pot hauling and his shit. And I take all these guys and their characters and their claim to fame. And I put them all in one fucking pile. And I went, dude, that's not even a year's work. I don't want to fuck. You want to hear a story? Back the fuck up. Here it comes, you know? So I got together, you know, this plan to to put this story together. And I felt that it was important. And I may have mentioned this earlier on one of the off, you know, camera things is that it was important for me to to pay respect and, and give respect to the people that I'm about to write it, uh, you know, write about. And which meant that if I I could actually say Mark's name, and I'll say it live because he doesn't give a fuck now. My partner, Mark, in the book, his name is Clark. And because he was implicated and indicted, I could, by all rights, say his name because I'm not implicating him in something that he was not, you know, involved in. But there were other names that I had to change a little bit, you know, because I couldn't, you know, they, you know, they weren't, you know, that close to the scenario. But out of respect, you know, I would change their names as well because if I couldn't get permission from you, you know, to do it, out of respect for you, I would change your name. But if you read the book, you'd know who you were, you know. And um, one name that I mentioned in particular, and we had a really awesome time. And, and um, uh, but I can uh, finish this train of thought first is, is um, when I decided to put this together, you know, and feeling important about getting, you know, letting the older generations know that what was coming, you know, because they're very conscious and very minded about, you know, the past and the history. And I don't want to, for, they want to forget about it. They don't want to be fucked with. They don't want to talk about it. They just want to leave it alone, let it go. But when they found out that I was doing this and I was doing it in a, in a quite a professional manner, they stepped forward, the older generations, and we, we had a discussion and, and, did, and agreed that somebody going to tell this story, it should be somebody that was there. Somebody that had, can tell it truthfully and exactly how it took place without any embellishment whatsoever. And second of all, we collectively weren't willing to allow 30 years or so to go by and all of us be dead. And some half-ass historian or some butt-fuck journalist gets all these different articles and patch quilts together a story that they think took place. We weren't going to allow that to happen. So this is a culmination of all that and all those years. And there's, I have told a lot that doesn't even exist in the book because having written this, I was contracted for an 80,000 word document through St. Martin's Press. This is 86,000 because I wrote over 200,000. That's because I can sit here for six hours and talk to you. Imagine how long the book would fucking be, <laughs> you know, if I had told it all, you uh -huh. know, in intricate, in detail, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, not give the entire story away, but have enough, you know, in my pocket to let you know that, you know, this is something that, you know, people in America should pay attention to. They should be made aware that, you know, when they took us out of the picture, quite literally, I had a meeting with the, um, supervisor for Homeland Security in South Florida about five years ago or so. He and I turned out have the same family physician and they were talking one day and he mentioned my name and this Homeland Security guy knew me. I know this guy. He called me a legend. I started laughing. I'm thinking. And so he asked Jeff, Scott, I mean, Scott Jaffe, my doctor asked him, you know, would you mind contact information? She like that being who he was, he, he knew I wouldn't mind. The guy calls me out of the blue one day and invites me to his office to have a conversation. He says, if you wouldn't mind coming to my office, Homeland Security. I said, fuck, I don't care. I'll show up. I pulled in the parking lot and got out and a Marine came out there with an M16 and met me <laughs> and escorted me into the building, you know, and I spent four hours getting information that I had no fucking idea about. And I was giving him information that he had no fucking idea about. But the biggest thing that I came away with was the fact that he said, when Operation Peacemaker came to a close, which was my operation and all my guys and all the five crews in Southwest Florida, over 260 people went down. <laughs> and that ended. 
That stopped it because that judge looked at me right flat in the fucking eye and said, Mr. McBride, if I ever hear of you or see you in a federal courtroom anywhere in these United States for this type of behavior, I will warehouse you for the rest of your life. And she was dead ass serious. And I said, no, ma'am, you won't hear, you won't see me again, you know? So, um, you know, it was just, uh, just a crazy wild ass fucking romp through the war on drugs. And, um, I, you know, particularly think it's important for people to understand that what the, what the supervisor told me was that when the operation ended, he said that quite literally ended Caribbean marijuana from coming into the country. That's the significance of what was taking place. He said it was quite a big paradigm shift in the marijuana industry. He said, because what took place was, and I had no idea that this is how it went. Caribbean marijuana, including Colombian marijuana, doesn't come to this country anymore. It goes to out North Africa and Europe. When they, since the day they stopped us, that's where it shifted to. And why? Because the cartels that existed in Mexico at that time, particularly Sinaloa, they've been around for fucking ever. There's nothing new about these guys. They didn't want their weed. They wanted to sell their fucking Mexican brickweed and mids and shit, you know, so they give up the cannabis shit. So they had no bit, a choice but to take it, you know, to those, to Africa and, and Europe. But what they did want was the cocaine because they couldn't grow the coca plant in Mexico. They could grow the opium poppy and create the black tar heroin and that shit that they have and that, and they could grow the weed, but they didn't have the ability for the coke. So when they stopped cocaine cowboys in Miami, they stopped us. That ended the importation of cocaine coming in in significant amounts in Miami. And who took it? Sinaloa. It all started going over there. That was the paradigm shift. That's what turned Mexico into what it is today. And I looked at this fucking supervisor dead in the fucking eye and I said, how does it feel having taken this industry out of the hands of a group of people that never fired one fucking shot at you? How does that feel? He says, I wish they just legalized the shit. (laughs) And I hear that out of a lot of these, you know, agents who are now some of my dear friends, uh, oddly enough, you know, and, um, and I, you know, he, and I said, T- if you could please tell me while I've got you, you know, captive, captive here, tell me honestly, in percentages, what you think the success rate and seizure of marijuana is along the southern border. You know, give me a number. It didn't take you. He didn't think about it. He said, maybe 1%. And I said, thank you. I said, because, yeah, thank you. Because you're not making a fucking dent in it at all. That's out of a hundred loads yeah. one they get. And I yep. said, you know, and I went on to tell him, I said, you know what, back in when we were kids and we, you know, we listened to the news at night and it was one of those, they would, you know, Reagan years. And he would say, well, drug seizures are up by, you know, X amount, you know, drug importation is down by X amount. And, and we're all watching this and we're thinking to ourselves, where are you getting your fucking information from, yeah. man? Up from what number and yeah. down from what number? What's your baseline, man? Yeah. What are you talking about? Because in our estimation, in those days, now you have to remember too that in those days, cannabis was and marijuana was considered the second most lucrative export out of Florida, next to orange juice. That's how much shit was coming through Florida, you know, and going everywhere else, everywhere across yeah. the United States, it was going to, you know, and um, you know, he said um. You know, you know, just quite literally, that was the end of it, man. He says, that was the paradigm shift. He says, we took you out of the picture and you guys and all you fuckers. And, and we still have a problem with it. And I said, well, that's because you're not, you have, you, you know, and he asked me quite literally, he said, how would you solve the problem? How would you, how would you end it? And this is seven years ago or so before Colorado even started their shit. And I said, legalize it. You know, take the demand out of it, knock the fucking sales out of it, you know, then they, then you won't have this fucking bullshit, you know, that's going on in Mexico and shit. Plus you take a a picture of a beautiful glistening, medically graded grown bud in all of its glory and goodness. And then you show another picture of this poor sweaty ass Mexican bastard who's laying in the desert, humping this one fucking bale, because if he does and his family is being held responsible for his failure or lack thereof, you know, ability to do it or lack thereof. Now ask them to point to which one they would rather smoke. 
you know which fucking one they're, they're going to point to. And that's when California and the Emerald Triangle, the Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties already existed. But that's when they started to budget. Because now you're dealing with mids that nobody really wanted, but it was available and that's what they had and shit like that. So that spurred these guys to do what they did. And that's what brought you guys to medical cannabis in 96. So at all that's being take, that's taking place, even what you guys are involved in on your awesome guests that you come on that amaze me with the, you know, the science and all this just technical shit, Thanks, man. man. You know, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And you guys do a wonderfully awesome job of, 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 you know, getting this information out and, um, um, it all springboarding from guys like me, mm-hmm. you know, when it was very simple and very quite simply that if you wanted to smoke weed, you literally had to take a boat somewhere, load that motherfucker up and bring it back. That's how you were going to get your shit. And it just took people like me and everybody that I grew up with, you know, and like I said, I can't take the entire pat on the back for this. I'm just a player in in the game. I'm the one that was, that stepped forward and was, you know, had the the ability, if you want, for the lack of a better way of putting it, to, to take the initiative and, 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 Take that risk, be that guy, you know, and put everybody to work because it was about putting everybody back to work again, doing what we loved, what we knew growing up as kids. And it just worked really well that way. You know, I mean, I didn't look for it. It just fucking happened, you know, but that's quite, that's how it took place. And then to see what it's come to today, holy fucking hell, man, I'm ready for a dab and, you know, and and dabs didn't exist. I know, right here, I got you. And, And how did I know? All that time, any of us that we were hauling fucking medicine around. <laughs> I mean, look at states like Oklahoma. I mean, like what we talked about earlier, right? All kinds of states all over the place. As soon as it vibrates, you're good. Good, cool. States like Oklahoma, like we talked about. What What do you got going on now? What uh, What are the go- the goals for the Saltwater oh, Cowboy? I mean, cl- right. closing out your sentence and stuff. How's it go? Because did you go to like a halfway house and like how how is those last few years feeling? Because ten years. It's a long time and well, here's coming, what to, coming to the end of it, did you get some time down or how does yes, that work? Yes, yes. And thank you. Cause I almost forgot to, to, to bring this up. When I got my degree, my, my legal degree as a paralegal and understanding how to shepherdize and go through um, United States law, which is set by precedent law. If you understand what precedent law is. That means that, if you're adjudicated one way, you have to be adjudicated the same fucking way. Your cases need to parallel in such a way where his adjudication needs to be the same as yours. It can't be out of whack. It all has to be fair and the same. So what I learned how to do was that, and I was very good at it, and plus making divorces for guys that had to get divorced because they were never going home again and shit like that. But um, you know, learning that and, and understanding the law degree you know, helped me. I was sitting there one day in my, in my office in the back, just fucking around. And we all use uh, what's called Black's Legal Dictionary. And it's the dictionary which prosecutors and um, defense attorneys use to define all the legalese. And I was just happened to sit there and I'm flipping the fucking pages like this and I get to where it's cooperation. So I read Black's Legal di- Dictionary's definition of cooperation. And basically what it amounts to is that if you ask me for something and I give it to you, then I have cooperated with you. That was the essence of their definition. Well, they asked me how the fuck I did all of this shit. I spent months telling them how it was doing, how it was happening. They even put me on a lie detector one day, took me past the interrogation room and into another room with a lie detector. Cause they didn't believe what I was telling them all the amounts and the money and shit like that. And I went out there laughing. And they, they were scratching their fucking head, <laughs> you know, but, um, I, um, I was sitting there and I saw that definition and I decided to go ahead and write my own brief to the middle districts of courts in, in Florida for reduction of sentence based on cooperation. Because according to this, I cooperated with your fucking ass. Yeah. Cause who were they to decide how much you just, dis- you cooperated. It's like they, they, they're using a sliding scale, basically like, well, you didn't cooperate enough. It's right. like, well, I gave you everything I had. They were pissed because they wanted to know who I'm dealing with in Miami and where I'm flying to all over the fucking place all the time. Well, I couldn't do that. I told you that I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But what I could do was tell you how I was doing, how fucking stupid you are, you know? And, um, 
so I wrote that brief with regards to cooperation and during uh, my, you know, uh, learning through my law years, you learn how to do what's called shepherdizing. And that is going through, uh, you know, when you see a movie in a lawyer's office, they've got all those fucking books that all look the same that line the entire wall. Those are the United States annotated codes. Those are all the law. Every case from every thing that's been adjudicated in the United States is in those books. And those books are annotated and updated every month. That was part of my job in prison. You add the new case law to those particular books. Well, my job was in preparing my own, you know, uh, re, you know, plea for reduction of sentence was to go through the shepherdizing process and cite case law that parallels my own, where people have gotten reductions and sentences reevaluated and shit like that for these certain reasons. And I cited fifteen separate case law, and that's what United States law is all about: precedent and the. Clerk has to read every single one that I cite and then, and then make sure that my comparisons are spot on. So I had sent that in and I had a court date and this is three and a half years in and I didn't want to take the writ and go out of prison and, you know, cause it took me two and a half years to get my bunk next to the wall by the window, you know, cause <laughs> you, you know, somebody either leaves, which is rare or somebody has to fucking die before you can move, you know? so. I didn't want to leave because I wanted my bunk. Mm -hmm. So I just called my brother that night before I said, you know, if you wouldn't mind, just, you know, show up on my behalf and, you know, and see what she, I don't have to be there. You know, just read her decision, you know, on my brief. So, you know, I'm shaking like a fucking leaf all fucking afternoon long. And I'm sitting three hours in the line for the phone, you know, and I called my brother up and I said, dude, what happened? And he looked, he says, um, just kind of matter of factly, he says, you weren't fucking that prosecutor at all, were you? <laughs> I said, I said, no, why? He said, cause she was talking pretty good about you, you know, because I was, you know, I was very me to this woman, you know, I'm not pretending to be anything other than who I am and I'll make her laugh if I feel like I can get her, get her to smirk or some shit, you know? So, and she actually, th you know, thanked me for, you know, the time that I spent and what I was doing for them. And the judge appreciated that as well. And I said, well, you know what? Besides all of this fucking around, dude, what happened? What did she do? What, what, what do I got? He says, she gave you four years. And I said, no, come on, stop. Dude, don't fuck with me. He said, no, seriously. She dropped your 10 to four. I'm three and a half in now. I'm six months short all of a sudden. I'm like, God damn it. I'm screaming. I fall off. I almost pulled the phone off the wall and I got 40 <laughs> convicts waiting to use the phone, dude. I would have been killed, you know? So in a matter of, you know, hours, I'm looking at, you know, going home, you know, after. You got, you got six so you got and a half out with that. I, basically. Yeah, I six got and my and own ass off. How many years? So you were three and a half years of maybe two to three years I of was, like studying and. Mm -hmm. Getting all these things done. Since and then the third week I was there, I began studying as a law clerk. I was three and a half years into being a full fledged. So go to the library, huh? Legal, yeah. legal. Everything that a paralegal does for an attorney is they're capable of doing everything except standing forward and litigating. They know everything a lawyer knows, except they are not allowed to stand in front of the judge and the jury and litigate. That's the amount of knowledge that I possessed when I got that degree. That's what helped me understand how to get through the process in order to do what it is I ultimately wanted to do. And that was all these other fucking guys are home, you know, most of them anyways, you know, and here I sit, you know, because you didn't agree that the, what I did, co you know, was cooperation in any way. Well, here, read your own fucking definition. I would have actually done 93% of that time because what they do is after the first year under the new law. You only get 57 days a year off your sentence. Prior to that was um, com computed gain time, but done by computer that gives you your computed out date when you can leave. But while you're in prison, after the first year, you begin to accumulate good time in days, three days a month for every year, for every month, for every year after that. So your time begins to shrink like this, you know, until you're, you know, till you're out and that sort of thing. Well, I would have been there for, you know, almost 10 full years if I had not done that. And I had always 
you know, was always under the impression that, you know, and I still am that, you know, the word rehabilitation um, should not be used in the same sentence as prison because there's no such fucking thing. Rehabilitation is only something that takes place if you wish to take advantage of it. It's offered to you, but you're not obligated to take it. Rehabilitation is on you. It's not the prison's in, industry's obligation to rehabilitate you. In my opinion, that word doesn't exist. Because what happens after you spend a certain amount of time in prison is you get what's called institutionalized. And I was only there for four fucking years, and it took me two years to you know, kind of get over that. You know, the shock of waking up and wondering, am I out of bounds? You know, am I somewhere where I shouldn't be? Or, or for the first year, waking up, not recognizing where I am. You know, it's frightening, you know, because of the control that they have on you. You don't piss unless you say, they say you piss during controlled movement. You know, you just, you're, you're not you. You are, I was, oh, I was, you know, 09498018. That was me. I didn't exist beyond a number to them, you know, and, and, that's why my friend George, when you read the book, had such a hard time with it when he was finally released after 34 fucking years, man. But I'm not going to give that away. You got to read the goddamn book. Yep. And figure that out. <laughs> one thing that you really were looking forward to when you got out, was there one thing? Was it food? Was it women? Was it, you know what I'm saying? Was it something that you were just like, man, I can't wait to get out because I want to. It was, you know, it was just to get home. Mm -hmm. And I guess be in a room alone or if my brother and his wife and the kids take off and go somewhere and I have the house to myself, I think that would be my, my go-to with regards to that question because um, there's nothing more lonely than feeling alone only having 1,100 other people around you still feeling alone but also feel alone you know it's just you know it's hard you know you never have that moment of silence and every time i hear a key against a hard door ching, fuck me <laughs> i want to jump out of my fucking shorts you know and funny thing about um you know when i it just re reminded me of the jingling of the keys the, the uh the warden would always come around every year you know with his keys Jingle, 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 you know, like Santa, and he would give the inmates a candy bar or something like that. You know, this was his deal. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't just a couple a month or so prior to that that Wayne ditched him. And so he wasn't having a good time. He didn't have a very merry fucking Christmas, man. You know, so he wasn't feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> no one dude ran off. No one gets yeah, candy. Yeah, the guy that the cabin too. Yeah. Man, <laughs> he was pissed. That's a great story. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, he was, yeah, no, he wasn't digging it at all. <laughs> That's funny as hell. No candy bars that year? <laughs> you know, no, uh, no, he was just smiles. Happy all, Merry Christmas and then all, all that shit. All. All in all, when you come home, like what's life like the, those few years when you're getting over and stuff like what, what are the type of, of things you do and, and lead it up to now? Like, what have you been up to? I stayed when I first got out. I had 52 days of halfway house. I did in a what was um, that like? Salvation Army. It was, you know, it was a pain in the dick, but, you know, it's you know, e easier rules to abide by than the ones I just came from. That's for sure. You know, the hardest thing I think is and you will read this in the book. I mean, you know, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I hope you. I hope you get the, the, the emotion that I, that I was meant to, to have the, the reader derive was my ride home in the bus from prison, from Tallahassee to Fort Myers. You know, that was a rather um, life-changing ride for me, if, for the lack of a better way of putting it. And I won't, I'll leave it at that because you'll need to read it. it was, you know, it's, it's, it's um, very dear to me, you know, and I want to choke up every time I think about this guy. You know, because he really made an impact on me, you know, so. But other than that, when I got home, I, I was uh, out of halfway house. Well, I had to have a job, first of all, that I go to every day and come back to halfway house. And that job was working with my brother. And it was a small site development business, on father and son and my brother and, you know, like that. They, invite, they had me come in to be a laborer and working and wound up building his business into a, a hundred employees. And I ran the the commercial division, I was building high rise footprints. I was building, um, um, subcontracting and building and excavating, clearing acres and acres of land with a land clearing crew and developing, 
um, um, gated communities. I would go in and take contract and develop everything outside the footprints of the homes. Builders did everything else like that. So I did that for a many number of years. And then um, as a single father, you know, I raised my daughter and my son on my own because their mom didn't want to have a fucking thing to do with us or whatever, you know, she made you, her So reasons. you had kids after you came home? After you, I came home. Yeah. So you didn't Thank have kids God I didn't have there. a relationship or any kind of those ties when I went in because I would have had to. I, would, I didn't want to, I'm praying to God and thanking that I didn't have to, to suffer through that because I've seen what it can do to people. I've seen guys literally run for the fence, man. I mean, had enough and scream and run to the fence thinking they're going to climb over this fucking thing and get out. And they don't get very far because that gun tower is right there and you, you can't see through the blacked out windows until that window slides open and a rifle barrel comes out. <laughs> and if you don't get off the fence by that time, he's going to take one warning shot at you. And then the next shot goes right through you until you get off the fence. But by that time, there's just probably a couple of cops there anyways to, you know, to pull you over. Still, I had seen, you know, I mean, I was given what was called uh, diesel therapy. They took me around before they finally got me Tallahassee, but I was in um, Atlanta federal max uh, where the big wall is. And you can't see anything outside that wall. There's no trees and no grass and no bushes. There's no fucking nothing. And it's, it's, a, it's such a place where the cops don't even come into the cell blocks unless they have to. And guys are selling um, Reader's Digest, National Geographics, and any kind of a thick magazine like that for outrageous, like $20 and $25 a piece and stuff. And what they were doing was using them as body armor. They would pull their shirt out, tuck those books into their belts like this, and pull the shirt back down because if somebody's going to stick you, that's your vital organ area. They can stick you anywhere else and you're going to live. But they're selling and using them as body armor. Two weeks after I've been there, we are released and we go into the chow hall and it's very regimented, very oriented. Nobody speaks and shit like that. Well, this one guy, I don't know, apparently he's doing life, you know. And for some reason, apparently word got out afterwards that he just didn't like the way the fucking guy in front of him talked. So he shanked the fuck out of him, stabbed him right there. And there's always two cops up in one corner over here and one in a cage in the corner over here with a gun, with a rifle. And just above them in the ceiling is a four by four area that they can shoot into, shoot a warning shot into. And when they saw that happening down there, they told everybody to hit the goddamn floor, boom, and they shot through those, through the a warning shot into the ceiling. And then once they did that, the gun went right down and it was trained on both of those fuckers, right? Even the guy that got stabbed. And I'm thinking, holy, what did I fucking get myself into, yeah. man? You're like, I'll take four bucks. <laughs> <laughs> holy fuck. But uh, yeah, there's nothing fun about prison, you know? Hell no. And, um, you know, but I'm just, I'm just blessed to be able to, you know, have gotten out and have a family, have kids. I got a grand, I got two granddaughters now, man. It's just the you know, most amazing thing. But, you know, what I like, I, I think I like best about, you know, everything that's come here and along the way and, and the culmination of what's taking place today is the fact that, you know, I can honestly sit here and give you the honest to God's truth about the beginning and the origins of cannabis in this country and how it began with a little old man by the name of Lauren Totch Brown. Look him up, man. He's an absolute legend in the Everglades. And um, his story is is literally about the beginning and the ending of Caribbean weed in this country, you know? And like I said, and I'm going to say it again, I don't deserve the full pat on the back because there were hundreds of people with brass motherfucking balls involved in doing this, you know, otherwise it wouldn't have gotten done, you know? Teamwork makes the dream work and that's with everything. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Man. Saltwater Cowboy. I feel like we're working on a movie next. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We are. What a hell Would of a story, cool, bro. Man. What a hell of a life. It's our longest podcast to date, and it's for a reason. It's because the story has so many lessons and so many highlights and so many lowlights, and then it all ends up with you here being able to tell it in person. Thank God. Right. Right. You know, and um, you know, quite frankly, and, I, and it's hard for me to realize, and, you know, I had talked to the guys that I grew up with, and they're like, who the hell, hell would want to hear that? You know, because us growing up was like, uh, it was just what we did. And I said, dude, you'd be surprised. You know, I'm the guy that stepped in. So 
I'm the guy that can now step outside the box and do this because I, I understand its value. I understand by value, I mean not tooting my horn. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not looking for any accolade or anything like that. Call me whatever you like to call me, legend. I don't give a fuck. That's you know a definition that's created by whoever's mouth it comes out of. All I am is a guy that's sitting here as humble as I can possibly try to be and explain to you my life growing up in, in this industry and all the wonderful, amazing dudes and gals that I grew up with. And there's one of them sitting right over there next to you. Next to us over there. Jerry K. Yeah, man. Fucking hell of a story, man. Go get the book, The Rise yeah. and Fall of a Marijuana Empire, Saltwater Cowboy. Get on Amazon. Support this man, Tim McBride. You've been through a hell of a hell of a life, bro. Hell of a journey. To me, you're a pirate. I think it was yeah. just generationally, like I think you were heritage of pirates you know and, it, and, and you were just doing what <laughs> that time in life's trade paid to do right and uh it was a man, necessity it couldn't have really been crazy. done any other way and i i thank you for that where can people find you that. instagram where can people reach out um, and talk I, to you? on instagram i'm at original saltwater cowboy and um what i'm also again fond of telling people because my book this is a hardcover edition this is a first edition and they're very rare they're being sold for over $200 on Amazon by individuals who know the value of the book. But five months ago, my uh, editor called me from St. Martin's Press. Now, when I was creating this book, I was given uh, Yana Poha was his name as an, as an editor for my book. <clears throat> the first 48 were, uh, thousand words of the book only had two edits done to it. Unheard of. So Yoha goes to another editor and, and Mark. Uh, Resnick, who championed my book in the beginning, couldn't jump in and beginning and help me. He was finishing up with a book called American Sniper. So when American Sniper was completed and went to copy edit, he jumped in and went on the second half of the book with me. <clears throat> and amazingly enough, we only had to do one edit out of the wow. whole thing, three edits out of the entire book. And it turned out to be that. And as an author, I couldn't be more pleased to have it turned out exactly how I intended it. And what I intended it to do is exactly what it does. It grabs you from the very beginning and pulls your ass to the front of your seat and holds you there to the last word. And, you know, that's gratification enough for me. But where I'm going is if you get the second edition, <clears throat> excuse me, second edition, it's a paperback, but it's everything the hardcover is. It's the very same shit. But instead of paying, you know, <clears throat> you got lucky. Well, now that you say that, <clears throat> actually, maybe we did pay about 120. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now but that you, you can buy it. now the second edition paperback, which, like I said, is everything that book is, only it's paperback for $21.99. So if you have a book, $21.99, or if you're interested in owning a first rare first edition, <clears throat> excuse me, I have people that like to, you know, and I and I tell them, and I'm going to tell y'all too right now. My email address is potholler, p o t h a u l e r at gmail dot com. <clears throat> if you purchase your book and you would like it inscribed, initial, signed, whatever, email me, and I will in turn send back information on how you can get your book sent to me. And I can put in it whatever you like to have put in it, and I can have it safely returned to you. That's the only way you're going to get a signed book unless, you know, you've got one here somewhere, you know, that, that needs to be signed. <clears throat> but to give you an idea, um, one thing that, we, uh, that, I didn't, um, that I didn't mention, and now that it's relevant with what it is we're talking about with the inscriptions and all, when I first met the boss in Colombia, that first day he walked into the room, he was sporting fatigue trousers, combat boots, an army belt and a sidearm and a t-shirt. And his hair is black, pulled back with a ponytail, typical South American looking fucking dude. <clears throat> and he comes walking in the room and he's on his t-shirt on the front, it says, got a smiley face. And it says, have a nice day. And as he walks past me, I look at the back of the shirt and it's got that same smiley face, the smoking bullet hole in its head and it says, or else. <laughs> Have a nice day or else. 
So this guy reads my book, Dave, and he says, would you please inscribe this for me? And I gave him that. <laughs> I like that. Where can oh, we show yeah, that to yeah, the camera? Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. We, can we see this? Yeah, we'll show it. We'll show it. Uh, we'll, we'll pull it up. You'll have you send it. Yeah, I'll send it to you and pull There's it up. There's a few things will pop up for you guys. The boats, uh, the way the bales looked, all those things we touched on yeah, in the beginning. Right. And yeah. if you want more, hop on the Patreon because we did a bunch of off the season. We got we an like hour plus hour on plus. off the mic. Get on Patreon. We support <laughs> you guys. Support the show. Um, Tim McBride, thank you for your time. Oh, man. We appreciate everything for this real. Is, uh, this is nothing, man. I This is what I do. This is what I love to do, you know, and, and you know, and if it can help, you know, the, the younger generation plus these younger growers and these, you know, these people that are in this industry now understand the humble origins by which this could be done peacefully and, and, and safely by families and generations of families. This is important for the history to know because import, more importantly, now that people have the opportunity to make an informed legal choice whether to try it or not to try it what i would rather have them going through their mind is that cool rasta dude standing out in the bush and his all his dreads amongst all of that cool ganja just doing his thing or that little colombian dude in his white cotton hat and his white blouse and pants you know just toiling away in the field just no you know peaceful as can be versus what's taking place on the fucking Mexican border, all the death and mayhem and destruction. Now, this is what I want them to go into thinking. Not that they're contributing to what's happening anywhere else in the world with regards to that cannabis, but knowing that there was a point in time in this industry that it could be done in that way. And that's, I think that's important for people to know because they, I think it would make them a little more relaxed in their, in their choice if you will. So, but anyways, guys, man, this is just, I mean, this is just so fucking cool. Well, and there's, there's people who pave the way with years of dedication and years in jail, uh, their lives. A lot of people died on the way. A lot of people to, to get to where we are now. Uh, it's amazing, man. It really is. It's like yeah. an unbelievable story. And it just, everyone we come in contact with, who's really laid down a lot, did a number of years in jail which is not to be uh, skimmed over, you no. know, it, that's a hard time. It's a serious consequence and mm -hmm. it's, and it's a, you know, it's a reality, you know, slap in the face because, you know, for years you, we operate under the guise and the attitude that if the adults weren't worried about it, we weren't. But then when it became us, you know, and now that burden fell upon us, it still didn't feel like a burden. It was just what we knew how to do and we knew how to do it very well. And that's, I mean, that's just something that caused us to not ever give up, but, you know, face the disastrous end that we did because of it. But, you know, I appreciate everybody out there that's, you know, that's in the cannabis industry, you know, pushing it forward. And, you know, um, all I'm trying to do is introduce you, you know, once, if people are now finally going to you know, wake up and join this revolution. I think it's important for them to know a few of the founding fathers, you know, and I don't consider myself one of those. The generations before me, I think, deserve that accolade. Man. So, but anyways, thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> Saltwater Cowboy, thank Tim McBride, episode 75, first smoke of the day. We're out. Yo, welcome to the Diamond Mine, the diamondmine.la, California source for boutique genetics powered by yours truly, Blackleaf. And you know what that means? That means I'm bringing my best genetics into this. I'm bringing stuff I've been hiding, harboring away, stuff I haven't wanted to let out. We're bringing all that into the diamondmine.la and we're gonna offer that to California. Go on our website, hit the newsletter, and see if you can rock with us. Get on board with some of our genetics and change your garden. The diamondmine.la, powered by Blackleaf.